Hi, and welcome to the Room of Rock with Ted and I. I love this, but I don't love this. I don't like the Epiphone headstock. The guitar is great, absolutely superb, plays well, sounds good, um, but I just think the headstock doesn't fit the body style. Why Epiphone stroke Gibson don't use the proper headstock, I don't know. Um, I bought this guitar oh, probably about 11 years ago and I, with the view that after it was out of its warranty, because I bought it brand new, I'd alter the headstock to make it the traditional open book stroke Dovewing Gibson headstock. Um, but when I got the guitar and really looked at it, it was so well finished and so nicely made that I couldn't actually bring myself to do it. Um, and I've been using it recently and enjoying it, but every time I look at it, I think oh, I really don't like the aesthetics of the headstock. Um, so, what did I do? Well, the first thing I went out and did was buy another Epiphone. Um, so I could practice on it, because I decided the time had come to bite the bullet and actually have a go at modifying the headstock. So, let me go and grab that one. So, I went on to um, eBay and got myself a second-hand Epiphone SG, this one. Um, I've taken the strings off at the moment because obviously it's, it's been worked on. Um, the reason I got an SG was for no other reason than the fact that the headstock, whilst it's the same shape as the um, Les Paul, because um, things like the Dot or the 335 has got an elongated headstock on them, and I do think they work a little bit better with the body style than it does on the, the SGs and the Les Pauls. Um, but the thing with this headstock is the, the Epiphone is um, an inlay, mother of pearl inlay, as it is on my Les Paul. And it hasn't got the Les Paul writing on it. This has got the coconut or the crown inlay in it. So it's further away from the edges of the headstock where I was going to be working to give me a bit more wiggle room as it were. Um, so the project evolved initially, I'd looked at a few videos on YouTube of how people went about doing it and I thought I was going to cut the sides of the headstock off and do it that way but as you'll see from the video once we'd got a template and started looking at the template versus the um, actual Epiphone headstock I noticed there was a lot more similarities than I thought and the position of the tuning holes wasn't as drastically different as I'd thought and I didn't consider it different enough to warrant plugging them and re-drilling them because um, I'm not I want it to remain an Epiphone I'm not trying to fake it I don't want to make it a Gibson or put Gibson on it I want to retain the Epiphone logo and the Epiphone serial number um, so I want it to be semi-authentic as it were. As you can see, Ted always plays authentic himself. Um, me, I've got a little bit less budget than Ted and I play semi-authentic. Um, so that's my thought. It's not going to be faking anything. So I want a, a nice approximation of the headstock. I don't want an absolute exact replica. That's not what I need. I just want it to be a bit more aesthetically pleasing. Um, but because I'd fallen in love with that, the Les Paul, I didn't really want to be starting with that. I wanted to practice on something else. So I got this. Um, the videos where I've started it, it, it looks like it's going to be quite long. So I'm going to split it into a few parts. Now, I'm sorry if it's a bit slow going, but I've tried to explain how I went about doing it and my thought process and, and how what tools I use to do the job. So if you are interested, you might be able to gain a bit of information on doing it. 
um, and then I've got to I have yet to order any finishing material so I've got to do that so I'm not in a position anyway to get any finishing done um, so I will certainly break the, the video up um, and I hope it's not too slow going for you I mean obviously we can't take any responsibility for you having to go yourself and wrecking your own guitar um, I went out and bought this guitar with the sole intention of having a go at modifying the headstock on it so I, I deliberately got something as cheap as I could I wanted one with a through neck um, I didn't want a bolt on neck or anything and I wanted the, the four controls um, so, and uh, ideally I wanted it in the cherry red because I thought the cherry red's quite a nice finish on the SGs um, the guitar itself is actually nice and it's it's remarkably good for what I paid for it. I bought it off of eBay for £120 um, and collected it from the, the vendor. Um, it was exactly as described and the guitars are good and basically. Um, one thing I'd point out is when I bought the wood and I bought two pieces I bought some mahogany for this because the neck and body on this are definitely mahogany um, and on the Les Paul um, I believe the neck is actually maple. Um, I've checked the stock um, specs on the internet and they vary but it does seem looking at an old website um, that it has a maple neck. So I bought the wood from Aluthia's supplies. So the theory being rather than just from an ordinary timber yard the wood should be you know of good quality and well seasoned. Um, because initially I thought I was going to be replacing more wood than I actually have done and I thought if I was replacing the whole sides then the last thing you wanted was the wood shrinking when it became into like a home environment where it wasn't um, quite as dry as you'd hoped and then it starting to crack or distort the headstock so that was just my thought behind it I thought if you're going to all the trouble of doing it, don't scrimp on just trying to find a bit of old wood you've got in the shed. Try and match up the wood um, properly to get something that's going to give you a pleasing result in the end. So, if you're interested in how we went about doing this, I had a little help from a friend, Kevin, who's um, quite experienced woodworker, and it was quite nice to bounce some ideas off of him and um, see how we were going to go about the project initially and sometimes it's just getting a bit of confidence and chatting with someone it makes you take the first step that pushes you on to do it if you like what we're doing here in the room of rock please give us a like and subscribe um, means a lot to us helps spur us on to do more videos so we've taken the headstock you'll see in the picture here and this is where we've got it to at the moment if you can see that I mean, at the moment, I've just put a little bit of black tape either side of the top there just to look at it optically to make sure I'm happy with it. And that's what it looks like on the back. And I think, you know, to me, that's a pretty good, I'm just trying to make sure you can see it, pretty good approximation of the uh, Gibson Open Book or Dove Wing headstock which I think is a, a really elegant headstock um, and I think the fact that this is an Epiphone so it's from the Gibson family means that what I'm doing is semi-legit and I've got an Epiphone acoustic, a 12 string which I've used I think in the past in videos um, and that has got the proper a headstock so in the past I think the 70s and maybe early 80s ones actually had them so it's you know I'm not breaking new ground here um, and hopefully it doesn't offend anyone, especially as the fact that I have no intention of trying to pass this off as anything other than a, an Epiphone, because I think there's no shame in playing an Epiphone um, with a slightly modified headstock, a slightly more graceful headstock. So, hang around, see how we get on. One thing I thought I'd demonstrate is how Kevin um, came up with the idea and what he did to cut the headstock initially to give us straight edges. Um, he did use um, a piece of scrap to test that he was going to get a good cut with his pull saw. Now I haven't got a pull saw. Um, a pull saw is basically a fine tooth saw 
um, with a thin blade that cuts on the pull stroke, as the name would indicate, whereas a lot of traditional woodwork tools cut on the push stroke. Um, and this is what's known as a, a gent saw. Um, and I believe the name coming from the fact that um, it was considered a suitable size for a gentleman to use if they were into woodwork um, or inlay or marquetry or something. So this is a gent saw. In fact, it's my dad's old gent saw. So it's seen a bit of action over its life. Um, now what I've done here is to simulate the headstock. I don't know if you can see that. I've marked sort of the curve that you get on the traditional Epiphone headstock. Um, Kevin, cut a block of wood here, which is a, a piece of um, plywood with a, an oak top on it. Um, so he knew that was at 90 degrees. He then, we laid it across the headstock like that, so you can see that we're suddenly cutting that corner off and making it a straight line. Um, then, We had scrap wood, so imagine this being the headstock of the guitar. So this is our guide, um, guide, headstock, and this is some just waste wood used to stop breakout as you break through, um, just to protect um, the back of the guitar from any lumps falling out. So now I'll clamp this onto the table. I mean, this is just to give you an idea in case you are considering doing something similar yourself. And obviously the other advantage of the way you're doing this is any pressure marking from the clamp at the tops taken by your guide piece and then on the back it's taken by the sacrificial piece that you're um, stopping breakout with. So then knowing that this is now set to the right angle and holding the blade against that is going to give you a 90 degree cut. He gently cut, again taking his time, no rush, making sure the blade's keeping tight against the guide piece. Now because this isn't a, um, a pull saw and I'm not sure how sharp this is now, um, we might not get as quite as clean and smooth a cut as Kevin got because Kevin's cut was really neat. It, in fact, it's so good that there was no finishing required at all. Um, when we'd cut that and cut the wood, it meant that they mated up perfectly as a glue joint because with woodworking, you need the glue face to be good. You, you mustn't think, oh, well, I'll whack some glue in there and that fill that. The glue faces need to be consistent. Ah, oh, so that's not done too bad a job there. So there you can see in theory you've got a straight edge there that you can then glue on your wood so that you've got something then to reshape and get the, the headstock as you want it, should you want to do this. Um, and I would suggest if you do, you do what I did and, and leave plenty of waste on there um, because of the fact that any marking when you clamp, if you're clamping, will be taken and, and will be on the, on the piece and it will be cut off later on anyway. One other thing I will quickly show you is that's the kind of end of clamp that we had started with. So that, it was a, a smaller version, this is it. And so basically, I don't know if you can see, I've thinned it down so that effectively that, that webbing at the back is pretty well the width of this piece. Um, I then rounded the face off so it'd go into um, a tuning peg hole without marking it. So it's follow that. And then I just rounded it a bit on the back as well so that goes right the way through. Um, and whilst we sacrificed a clamp to do that, the clamp would still be useful because if you were clamping something and you had some waste, you could still drill a hole in it and use the same method and then assuming that hole gets cut off from the workpiece later on. Um, but 
yeah I mean these clamps these type of clamps aren't expensive and this one Kevin gave me because he'd bent it and he'd straightened it a bit and I've had another go at straightening it up but it, it did the job brilliantly um, meaning that it um, was easy to clamp because otherwise I've seen people using rubber bands and things and it's it's an awkward thing to do but that just shows you how we cut the headstock initially this first shot shows Kevin having set the piece up testing to make sure his method would work the second shot shows the headstock actually being cut and you can see from this that the first side's already been cut off and how smooth it is this shot shows Kevin cutting it you can see he's putting pressure against the guide and also just how thin that slither of headstock that he's cutting is. This shot shows the headstock once the piece has been cut off. You can see just how neat it is. Um, and it shows you the guide. There we've gone in a bit closer now. It shows the guide and the sacrificial piece of wood. You have seen an extremely neat cut. This shows the slithers of headstock cut off. Now the damage on one is from previous headstock damage. Nothing we've done. So you can see how thin they are and there you are you're looking at the back of the headstock there and you can see just how neat the cut is and there's really is no breakout and that's a perfect edge for gluing onto same uh, headstock just flipped over now and the chipping on the edge of there is from part of that previous headstock damage so we're going to be cutting a lot of that off when we are uh, done this so that's a good thing um, this shot shows us matching up the grain as best we can on the headstock so that um, the grain lines follow on. This shot shows the new wood being glued into position on the headstock on the cuts we've made. Um, this is yet to be sanded so it looks pretty rough. Um, this is it from the back and you might be able to just see the grain lines hopefully matching up um, with old and new because the grain is visible under the lacquer. Um, this last one shows us um, the modified clamp going actually all the way through the headstock so you can see how it works to put even pressure on the headstock and the wood. Well, we've moved outside now so you can A, we get a bit more light and get a bit more space around us to work. Um, and one thing I thought I'd show you is something that I've cobbled up, up out of a bit of old scrap wood that I had lying around. Um, which is just like a little work stand to hold the guitar on to try and make the job a little bit easier. Um, the job's going to be um, fiddly enough without making it hard for yourself so I thought throwing a little bit of time um, and a little bit of effort at um, a stand to hold the guitar and protect it was well worthwhile. Um, it's made out of just some old scrap timber I had lying around in the garage and the covering on it is just some old carpet underlay we'd recently had carpets done um, and me being a hoarder held a bit of the old underlay back and it's coming useful to act as like a protective surface so that the guitar is not getting bashed around um, the neck rest here look I've made out of a couple of pieces of scrap wood and um, I cut the U in them using a fret saw and then I just fold it out to the size I need using a um, a coarse wood rasp just to get a, a stand. It didn't have to be immaculate because it's going to be protected by the uh, carpet underlay but it will help protect the guitar. So that sits like that. What I'll do I'll uh, drop the guitar in so you can see how it works and it means that the headstock will be here so I can maybe sit somewhere around here and, and work on it gently to uh, start reshaping it. Well here's the guitar and as we know now it's, it's got the extra bits of timber glued onto the headstock um, and you probably can't see it but we've tried to match the grain so it follows the headstock so that when it is refinished it's less visible. I'm, I'm not kidding myself that this is going to be invisible but when you look, I don't know if you can see that at the back of the headstock there is a distinct join line there anyway and the grain varies um, where it was made in the factory so they're obviously very uh, very sure that their glue is good um, but we've tried to follow the grain lines here 
rather than just having them going off any way willy-nilly and obviously then it'll mean there's a bit of continuity so the guitar's gonna sit in there like that so it's supported so that I can uh, start marking out the headstock um, the glue I used was this one uh, not recommending it or anything at the moment because this is the first time I've used it but type on does seem to be the glue that luthiers use um, when you watch YouTube videos so I thought if you're going to the trouble of doing this you might uh, as well use the, the best glue that or the glue that's recommended um, I initially intended to cut the sides right off and um, then reshape the whole sides but looking at the templates I've got, and I'll overlay a template on this, now how accurate they are I don't know, it looks like there's a lot less work needed to get a good approximation of a, a, the Gibson style headstock. I'm not saying it's going to be 100% accurate, but then I'm not trying to fake this. All I'm trying to do is just make the headstock slightly more pleasing to my eye on my guitar. Um, so I'm making the job a little bit harder for myself because I obviously want to keep the Epiphone logo and I also, to retain a bit of continuity, want to keep the uh, code number, the serial number, sorry, on the guitar. So I don't want to try and hide anything. The guitar's an Epiphone and, and it's, it's a nice Epiphone actually. plays well. So it's, it's nothing wrong with the guitar at all. Just don't like the headstock. Now Kevin, my friend who assisted me with the cutting off of the corners of the headstock um, made up a couple of CAD templates using his 3D printer. Um, these vary slightly in difference in hole positions um, from one another and one slightly longer than the other. But um, the one I'm following is this one which fits up to the nut there and is pretty well the same width here slightly narrower there slightly narrower there so this is going to be the reference point um, and I think what I'll do first is put some masking tape down the edges here so I've got something just to mark out the headstock shape on in pencil so I know where I'm working to what line I'm working to um, what I will do is test my coping saw that I'm going to be cutting the ends off um, on some scrap wood to see how bad the breakout is on the back um, because if I'm getting a lot of chipping on the back on the pull stroke of the cutting action on the saw what I'll do I'll cut from the back because any breakout is going to be a lot easier to hide on the front of the peg head where it's black um, than it will be because you could put a little bit of wood filler in there just to cover it than it will be on the back which is obviously got a semi um, transparent finish to it so you can see the grain through the uh, through the, the red lacquer how well I'm going to match that up I don't know I mean this is very much a work in progress um, but the intention is to get it so that the eye is not immediately drawn to it you know um, and due to the action of reshaping the sides here um, all the side lacquer is going to come off so you know you've got an edge here to redo the sides on um, and the same here so that should make the joint there less visible and in theory looking at the colour of the mahogany I've bought and chips on the guitar here it's a pretty good match so you're starting at about the right point well, we've moved in a bit closer, so hopefully you can get a better view of the uh, headstock. Um, what I thought I'd do, rather than test on scrap wood, I would um, use just the edge of the actual wood I'm doing, so that's going to show exactly what how it performs. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but that's a fret saw. That's we're getting. <laughs> quite a few aeroplanes flying over at the moment. Um, we're not that far from Biggin Hill here and uh, Biggin Hills uh, it's the air display this weekend so there is more light aircraft noise than normal. Um, so that's a fret saw and that's the saw I intend to use um, and it cuts on the pull stroke if you've never used one of these before so a lot of 
cuts wood saws cut on the push stroke but this cuts on the pull so it's more likely if it's going to tear or chip the wood it'll chip on the back if I'm cutting this way up so I can see if I just cut a little edge just see how that works and if it isn't cutting it too badly and marking it too badly um, I will work from this way if not I'll flip the guitar over there are various um, blades you can get for it in terms of um, I don't know if you can see that but in terms of the type of teeth I've gone for a fairly fine one I've got some more coarse ones but I thought I'd start with something fairly fine rather than something too aggressive so what I'll do I'll just cut the edge here Take your time, don't go mad. And let's see what we've got. So that's the edge I've just cut as you can see it's quite a neat edge and um, it's very small um, width of saw cut um, and looking at the back there's very little break out there if, if none and the same on the front so and the finish is pretty smooth um, so to me I'm happy now to put some masking tape down the edges of the neck um, or the edges of the headstock sorry um, and then get a pencil out and pencil mark the finished shape um, so I've got something to work to now what I'll probably do dependent I don't think there's enough coming off here and here to warrant a saw cut I think I'll do that with coarse sandpaper on a sanding block um, but I think the first thing to do is at least get it marked out so I can see where I am aiming to cut to. This is the um, masking tape I'm going to use. Um, it's just a what they call a painter's masking tape. Um, it does come off easily without risking damaging the finish. The first time I used this was when I did the fret dress on the vintage V130 um, and I was very impressed with it. A um, how well it stayed on and B how easily it came off without a load of residue. Um, so I'm going to use this on the headstock and what I've decided to do thinking about it is put a bit of masking tape on both sides of the headstock um, and then mark around my template with pencil so that when I'm cutting or filing or sanding I can see to make sure that I've, I'm not cutting at an angle I'm trying to keep as um, 90 degrees to the front of the head stock as possible. I mean, I think a whisker off isn't going to matter because these things, I think, uh, are very much finished by hand at the, in the factory. Um, it's amazing when you look on videos of guitar factories, even in the in the more budget end of the market, how much of the work is actually done by hand because there just isn't the machinery to do it. And I think they tend to be pin routed. And, but the final drum sanding tends to be done by hand. Um, anyway, so let's put some masking tape up the front and uh, up the back.
doesn't need to be anything other than basically just on there so that what I'm thinking is it it would be impossible to see any kind of marking line on there on a black headstock with a, a pencil or anything I, you could scribe it carefully with something sharp um, but I don't feel the need for that So we've got some tape up the back and some tape up the front. One thing I will do is get a scalpel and just cut the holes away because I intend to bolt the uh, template through just to keep it secure both sides and give me a reference point. Now um, if you're thinking of doing this uh, yourself and you're thinking well he's lucky he's got this template. I, yes I am lucky I've got a, a clever friend that could do this because I wouldn't be able to do it um, but I had intended to just do it cutting it carefully with a coping saw out of a piece of plywood. Plywood's quite a good wood for using for templates because the way the plies are laid they're laid at 90 degrees to each other and so it does make for a, a pretty stable um, template so they're quite good things to use um, whereas if you use something like a softwood maybe a the edges are more likely to get chipped in use um, and they are less stable in time they, they, they shrink contract and possibly warp whereas a sheet of plywood especially at the small size you would use there would actually be fairly stable so okay it would have taken me a bit longer to do that but I think with a job like this you've got to just not plan on a finishing date. It's no good thinking I want this for a gig in two weeks time because certainly you know if you're someone like myself doing this at home you might not have the weather to spray the finish and the lacquer and let it dry long enough because you need a, a preferably warm certainly uh, not a humid day you don't want any moisture out there that's going to get in the finish and make it bloom or, or discolour um, and I've even had it when I've sprayed stuff um, in bad conditions trying to get away with it in the past and it just doesn't dry maybe the moisture's been sucked into the paint as it's curing um, and the moisture can't escape the water moisture in the air and it just never cured properly uh, just a fact so you know, um, it's best not to put a time frame on it, just view it as a, you know, a bit of a project, something you're going to enjoy doing and you're going to enjoy the end result. Um, the fact that this guitar I bought off of eBay, especially to do this, um, meant that I don't need it for anything. So if it takes me a few weeks to do, um, that's fine and obviously making the video slows it down because y you're trying to show people what you're doing now this might turn out a complete disaster we don't know yet <laughs> it's a, very much a work in progress and something I've not done before but uh, anyway I will uh, go and get a scalpel and just cut round because it's only the centre holes on this particular template that line up these holes all do line up but then it doesn't line up as well with the end so it's a bit of give and take. Now when I'm doing something fairly fine I tend to prefer a proper scalpel than a snap-off knife or a Stanley type knife because you've got so much of a finer point I don't know if you can see that there but um, it's much finer um, obviously the blades don't last as long what I do to protect the knife when it's not being used is just push it into a piece of cork to make it safe because the trouble with these is don't dream of putting one in your pocket even with that on um, because obviously <laughs> they're designed to cut skin and cut it very well 
um, but if you're just leaving it in your toolbox or your craft box or whatever, um, cork on it, lay protect the blade and protect you when you're diving around in your, in your box. So. in the cork, the front done. Again, back in the cork for safety as soon as you finish using it. And there you go, that's the back done now. Start with the, the front. What I've done is just got a couple of bolts so I can uh, locate it. Again, this I'm not even. This is only going to be finger tight. It's just to prevent it sliding around. So I'm not worried about marking the finish on the back of the neck because a there's some masking tape there. I'm just visually centering it against the um, top of the headstock and the sides now so I can see, I don't know if you can see, but looking through that uh, you can see that the difference in, in outline and you can see here is pretty good and even here um, pretty good. What I'm using to mark this, with when you're marking wood you want to use pencil, don't use pen because um, the ink can be absorbed into the grain of the wood and it can actually, you can sand it to size, finish it ready for thing, spraying and you can still have ink in the grain that can bleed into your final finish. So you're much better off the same with tiles if you're ever tiling you don't mark the back of a tile with a, a pen or a felt tip because it can migrate through the porous um, china and then you can start getting marks coming through on the front of the tile just a, a little tip there you use pencil I'm just sighting that up to make sure I'm happy that's about right Also, the, the pencil I'm using, um, if you can see that, is a um, mechanical pencil or a, a propelling pencil. Um, so it's always fairly sharp. That, that's, this one actually is a 0.7mm, but it does mean that you'll get a fairly narrow marking line. Undo that. Looking at that, if that template's to believe, be believed, look, that's pretty well following the outer part of here. It's only really starting to come in from the narrowest point. 
and as I say I'll take a view on these areas if I think it needs it aesthetically I will take a file to them or a, a uh, block of sandpaper so I'll repeat the process now on the reverse so I'll flip her over and this is going to be slightly more fiddly rather than harder to um, mark because I haven't got the, the luxury of the nut to give me a reference point but really this is just to make sure that I'm keeping my saw cut at 90 degrees and not undercutting on the back so that when you come to finish it it doesn't marry up right, again I've visually centered that up and if, if you're taking it slowly then with hand tools you've got the option of looking at it as you're shaping it and then maybe just altering it thinking one side needs to come in a fraction more one side doesn't um, these are options that are open to you you know the good thing with using hand tools which is what I intend to do is the fact that you have got a bit more thinking time if you're using a power saw or a you know a power jigsaw which I've got in the in the garage um, it could have cut five millimeters before you've realized your lines wandered and also with tools like a jigsaw or a router because the one thing Kevin and I had thought about doing was using the template to run a router up the side of which you'll see luthiers doing that when they're um, making things in so there you go again look you can see the rough difference either side um, yeah as I say luthiers that are doing things on a regular and they basis and want repeatability um, even if they're only a, you know a small handmade limited run set of guitars um, they would use routers to maybe do the initial shaping um, but the problem is again we were worried that you've got the nut and that you you've got you've got to have a flat space for the base of the router to sit and even a small router you know because I think that if you used a um, Dremel type router on a base I don't know it'd be man enough to cut through something that thick or it would take so many passes that really it's kind of not worth the aggravation to do it. So that's given us our, our ears there. And as you can see that will follow on pretty well from here. And it's, but if you can see that, what, what I've done now, I've just looked at it and double checked I'm happy with my markings um, just to see if it looks like a good start point and then again we've got the same on the back of the headstock the eyes the human eye is an incredible thing and you can look at something and just think that doesn't look quite right you might know not know why it isn't right but you know it isn't right so you know just trust your judgment on saying you know look at it and see if you think it looks about right I mean the, the, the other good thing is that once this is strung up with strings, you know, coming across here, it is going to break up the look anyway. But you obviously want to aim to get it there or thereabouts. Well, thank you for bearing with us till the end. Um, that's probably a good place to end part one. Um, the footage for part two shot, which is where we're going to actually start shaping the new headstock. Um, so you've seen us adding the wood um and the initial marking out and checking and working out how we're going to go about it and how the plan evolved and changed so hopefully it wasn't too boring and drawn out and by the time you've got to watch this maybe part two will already be up if not it won't be long because as i say the footage is shot for it. it just needs editing up and tidying up um so anyway we'll see you again soon in the room of rock with ted and i